So today we are starting our discussion of features of print culture. And we're going to be drawing extensively on a chapter from Elizabeth Eisenstein. What I really wanted to do here was actually bring in some of the topics that we've covered in our last few voice threads and explain kind of how I think some of the discussion from Eisenstein is actually going to help answer, I think, some lingering questions that have been raised thus far. So the first thing that I actually wanted to talk about was actually this question that came up in our technology of print voice thread. And it was a thing that sort of like really fascinated everyone. And there was like, well, this sort of lingering question, like, why is it that the press itself remains static for approximately 300 years, right? Like, we're used to this environment where technological change happens very rapidly. I don't think that I or anyone has like a really solid knockdown argument as to, you know, well, the, here's the one answer about why that's the case. But one of the things that I think is particularly promising as an answer to this question is just that the early press did so much to spark a lot of social and cultural change that in some sense it kind of started the ball rolling and there were changes in lots of other areas that stemmed from the printing press so that in some sense you know the press itself was just this sort of impetus for change and it took a long time for like different the different kinds of innovations or different kinds of things to catch up and so it's not actually until the 1830s when we have a lot of um, mechanization and automation that can happen with the press particularly as it happens with like newspaper printing where we see real novel innovations to the press itself that actually sort of have different kinds of like cultural ramifications that's not to say that the printing business is static. Um, and in fact, I think you've seen from our last voice thread that there was actually quite a bit of change that happened in, um, in printing and in the books business, um, you know, just stemming from lots of other kinds of social, different sorts of like social political kinds of things. So there's a lot of change in the industry. Um, particularly too, there's also changes in like things like the cost of paper and, um, you know, as demand shifts, right, costs change. And so there are constantly sort of new ways of thinking about how you can build sort of different kinds of wholesale models and things like that. So even though the print press itself remains relatively stable, there is just a ton of change that's happening surrounding the invention. So it's not as if everything, everything stays the same. It's really only that the technology of like the press is really sort of that, that's, that's stable. Um, but in terms of cost models or, or how things are sold, that, that all changes actually quite rapidly over, over the course of that 300 years and in different regions, according to different kinds of demands. Um, so I think that's really interesting. That I think is a really nice way of framing our discussion of print culture. So as I've been kind of sort of, I think, laboring the point perhaps um, as we go through these sort of videos, one of the things that I really want us to highlight is just that, you know, we in some sense are really coming to this question and coming and examining this from the perspective of people that are really, um, even if we're not currently kind of enmeshed in it because we might be shifting into sort of like a digital culture, we're still very familiar with the contours and the features of print culture. And in some sense, we really take them for granted. So I thought that um, actually Andreas had this point when we were talking about the paradoxes of the print revolution where he said, yeah, you know, it's interesting because you read them and you're like, oh, wow, this is really like mind blowing. And then you're like, oh, wait, as you read into it, you're like, yeah, but I already knew that, right? Like that seems very familiar. Um, and I think that's kind of the point about print culture, right? It's like, this is kind of the world that we live in, but it had to be created. And it's really interesting to be examining this like particular kind of historical shift. Um, and it's hard for us, I think, sometimes to sort of 
you know, imagine how those shifts happen. You know, it was really funny for me um, and interesting to see the discussions about Fust and um, Gutenberg, where there's this sense of, well, yeah, but like, what about copyright laws? And the story is that there weren't copyright laws at the time. Um, and actually, um, there's some suspicion that actually the um, idea of the sort of like the romantic author, or like the sort of genius conception, gets built into different kinds of conceptions about authorship and why it's valuable as a justification for kinds of copyright laws because there's this rampant problem of piracy. So you sort of look at this really early period in history and you can kind of see different kinds of conditions that, that like are very different from what we have today and may have created an environment where we see different kinds of ideas evolve, right? And so I think that is a really valuable thing to be thinking about and sort of constantly reminding yourself. And it's hard because you have to kind of make it a practice in order to study it because it's so easy for us to take the sort of background conditions of our lives today for granted, right? I mean, that's the whole point. They're background conditions, and so we don't necessarily think about them. And so I think that is the sort of really valuable and really interesting thing that we need to be thinking about. The other thing that's really interesting as we sort of go further into Eisenstein is that my perception from talking to students is that Eisenstein is a much more difficult read. And so I've really been purposefully trying to give students more practice reading Eisenstein and trying to sort of struggle out and tease out her own points without as much of my input right now. Um, and then I'll be giving a lot of feedback um, on this on this current voice thread as we go along so that when you sit down to write the paper, it's not like this is going to be the first time where you're having to read Eisenstein and say, okay, well, what is she really trying to say here? So we're going to start that practice process now. The first thing that we're going to do is rather than have me kind of give the introductory lecture and then you guys talk about it, is actually you're going to be doing the reading, coming up with your own sort of ideas about how you think, like what you think the main points are. And then I can kind of come in and say, yeah, this is really good. But the idea is that it gives you a little bit more practice of having some independent um, reading and independent sort of like I have, you know, like you have to kind of figure it out on your own before you go off and write the paper. And it's not totally independent. I would strongly encourage you actually to um, look at the quiz very early on and take notes about it because the quiz is actually a really good um, guide for what I see as the most important points about these um, particular six features. Um, so having said that, I'm really excited to like listen to what you have to say about the voice threads. I'm gonna be um, participating a little bit more actively um, throughout it rather than sort of commenting at the end. I'm gonna be commenting as we go through. Um, and so I'm really looking forward to seeing what you have to say about Elizabeth Eisenstein. Um, and I hope I hope it's not too difficult. She is, she, is, she is dense. And so that's one of the things I want you guys to kind of feel comfortable sort of like taking a stab at different kinds of ideas and then we'll tease it out together on the forums.